Hello, everyone. I'm Shalonda, Big ID's Demand Generation Manager, and I'm so excited to have you all here today for our webinar, Bits, Bytes, and Barriers, The Art of Minimizing Data Security Risk. We've got a lot in store for you today, diving into the realms of security, data, and technology. We'll also be exploring ways to bridge the gaps um, to fortify your organization's data security risk. But before we get um, into it, we have a few logistics. If you have any questions during the event, be sure to use the questions tab located at the bottom of your screen. Please don't be shy. Uh, we'll also be hosting a live Q&A at the end of the webinar, so make sure you stick around. Now, without further ado, I'm excited to hand the virtual floor over to Omar Kawaja, Databricks Field CISO, and Christopher Glover, Big IDs Field CTO. Uh, can you both introduce yourself and give us a little background about your experience? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Shalanda, and uh, thank you to uh, Big ID for uh, for hosting this uh, the session. I'm uh, Omar Kawaja. I serve as the field CISO. I lead our field security organization at, uh, at Databricks. Uh, prior to this, I spent nine years working at CISO as CISO of an organization that had uh, financial services, uh, several insurance companies and hospitals and technology services and uh, a retail arm. Um, and I, uh, I uh, have the privilege of sitting on the boards of the FAIR Institute, which is all about cyber risk quantification and high trust, which is all about uh, making the uh, job of compliance, so compliance against networks easier. And uh, I, uh, one of my favorite things is I, I get to teach at uh, Carnegie Mellon University's uh, CISO program. So that is a little bit about me. Hi guys, I'm Christopher Glover. I'm the field CTO at, at Big ID. I've been in uh, data management, data practices and technology for about 30 years. I uh, spent 12 of those years at uh, PayPal and eBay where I led functions in data uh, operations, architecture, enterprise data architecture, and then data products. And so I've had a lot of experience with working with security teams and hand in hand with security teams. So excited to be talking to Omar today a little bit about our experiences and, and how, you, uh, how you work in the world of security and data. Well, to kick things off, I've got a two-in-one question for you both. First up, how do you run a program without being consumed by regulations? And secondly, how do you manage to leave some bandwidth for addressing risks for specific business? Yeah, you know, I, I think um, you know a few thoughts. One is to take sort of that first principles approach of why do the regulations exist? Why do these uh, compliance regimes have the particular controls that they mandate on the entities that uh, that they provide coverage for, and you know I've had the good fortune of working with uh, regulators and legislators at the national level and at regional and industry levels over over a long period of time, and and I've yet to come across a regulator, or a rule sort of definer, a control selector that has said, hey, we should we should really put these controls in as requirements for our covered entities because it would be a really fantastic way to annoy the heck out of them. And so we <laughs> often think of compliance and regulation as it's something that's being done to us. It's a punishment. It's a waste of time. But if you think about it and put yourself in the shoes of the people that, that wrote it, that was never their, their intent. I actually had a, uh, a, national legis a national regulator say to me a couple weeks ago, they said, Omar, we don't like compliance. And I said, I know nobody likes compliance. And I figured even the regulators, you don't like compliance. And they said, Omar, how do we go tell people what to do and they not think of it as compliance? I said, well, you can't because you are the regulator. So the definition of compliance is doing what someone else says to do. And as a national regulator, you sort of are going to be the originator of many compliance requirements. What you want to be able to get across is making it clear, going back to first principles, why is it that those requirements actually exist? And so when I ran an organization, a security program, I try to set the bar high. So I wanted to make sure that my customer's data, our own intellectual property was protected at the, uh, at the, the highest level possible or the highest level really that was reasonable and practical. And by setting the bar high, what we did 
is we ended up sort of superseding any of the compliance requirements. So when I started at Highmark, for instance, there was just one regulatory body that provided oversight over us, and that was uh, OCR, uh, Office of Civil Rights under Health and Human Services, which is the law enforcement arm for HIPAA. When I left Highmark earlier this year, there were close to 26 different regulatory bodies that had some kind of opinion on how we should make sure we're protecting the information that we had across the enterprise. Um, I don't think there was a single one of those where we actually had to go deploy, well, I guess with the exception of one, we did not have to deploy any new controls because what we said is we're gonna set the bar high we know what the intent of these compliance regimes is. It's to protect and secure certain stakeholders' data. We care about that as well, not because someone else told us to, but because this is part of our business and we put our customers first. And if you do that, you're probably going to be fine. And the other part is just make sure you ask, why is there a compliance requirement around X or Y or Z? And then the last piece, and you know, I, I did a long LinkedIn post about this a couple of days ago, it is a maturity continuum. When you start, you are going to be compliance focused. You are going to look around and you are going to pay attention to who is asking me, who is telling me, who is demanding that I put certain controls in place and I just wanna go focus on that. But Shalanda, to your question, it's really, really irritating to, for your entire job to just be focused on do this because someone else said so, right? This is the reason we all were very, very excited when we finally left our parents' home. If I don't wanna make my bed, I won't. I don't want to, I don't feel like it. And then you get to a certain age where you're like, oh crap, I actually want to make my bed. And it's not because my mom said so, or my dad said so, or my brother's gonna tell on me, it's because I realize it makes me feel good. It sets my day out. Right. And I like that feeling. So I'm going to do it, not because I'm trying to be compliant, but because I think it's good it's for good me. For me. And the action and is exactly the same. But once you sort of understand the spirit of the meaning behind it, you actually find value or maybe even joy in it. Yeah, I would add on to that really quickly is that it's, it's the, I think the way you said that was brilliant, which is this is being, you know, get away from that mentality of this is being done to us. Um, I like to position it as this is being done for us. You know, yeah. as you go into these regulatory periods, like going your own and trying to define what those controls are and figuring out how you're going to respond to this, that's, that's hard to just stake out in the world and have your own position. But a lot of times these regulations come with a set of suggested controls and it gives you a framework to operate off of. So it makes it easier for you to respond to kind of new regulatory territory like we're going into with AI these days. Absolutely. You know, you all put it in, in, in such terms that I fully understand, you know, no one likes compliance, you know, no one likes to be told what to do, but it's important to understand why they exist, why it's important. Let's make it as easy as possible to implement, like to follow these uh, regulations through automation. So yeah, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Thank you both.